Welcome to Cynical Celluloid, the place to go when pigeons ain't roosting in your head in quite the right order. This episode, there's a nutter with a chopper swinging for all they're worth, causing terror in a small town, and leaving a hundred questions for a baffled police and populace. Sharp-edged weapons and a trail of bloody corpses litter the screen in Jose Ramon Loraz's giallo-esque slasher, Edge of the Axe. People are being turned into bloody kindling by a masked murderer of the big chopper. An axe, that is. Screams of fear and agony ring through the North Californian forests as victims meet the blade of the mysterious killer, while the police are baffled. Relationships in the town are coming and going, and newly formed couple Gerald and Lillian find themselves in the middle of a mystery, but with people being hacked up left and right, then everybody comes a suspect. Can the killer be stopped, let alone identified? Edge of the Axe is described as a slasher, but it's a rather uncommon one for the genre. At least if you've only really known the US slashers, for one thing. Although it carries strong vibes of the late 70s and early 80s American films, it presents itself with a rather prominent 1970s giallo flourish, meaning that for a 1988 film, it comes off far more like Mario Bava's 1971 murder mystery, Twitch of the Death Nerve, aka Bay of Blood than it does the derivative US offering of Friday the 13th, for instance. Funny enough though, the killer in this film carries more than a little nod to the American slasher, with the killer donning a mask that is, well, somewhat familiar to one of the classic movie monsters. And while I'm not generally given to references in other films, and I'm assuming it's deliberate of course, it's kind of fun to note that this is an instance of a Euro exploitation movie given recognition to its US cousin, while still wearing its own native sensibilities on its sleeve. Murder mystery is the order of the day, and we're immediately thrown into carnage with an unexplained murder. Now, this murder really does set the tone for the movie. The kills in the film are violent, like giallo-level violent, and they're bloody for sure, but they're not exactly gory. Oddly enough, this kind of works in the film's favour for me. There is a watering down factor which we'll look at a little here, but it should be clear that the kill scenes, they, well, they really are disturbing at times. The gore levels being less than you'd expect in something like Friday the 13th feel a bit more real for it. The frenzied attacks just aren't interrupted by stopping to examine the damage. That much is left to your imagination. Beyond the gallons of stage blood being squirted around the scene, of course, but it feels oddly first person at times. Now, of course, that's not going to be to everyone's taste, but for me, it kind of made it feel more real. There is, forgive the non-intentional pun, an edge to the movie. The kind of spikes of cruelty that Giallo revels in run through the events, but that's not to say that it doesn't have its sense of humour. Unlike something like the film Pieces, Edge of the Axe doesn't really lose itself in these moments, though. And there's something quite normal, for want of a better word, about how the film handles its more humorous moments. They don't interfere, and they don't make light of the darker aspects of the film. And it rarely slips into cheesiness. It's a quirky film, though. While most slashers have little windows through which we vicariously enjoy the action through the eyes of the killer, Edge feels more like we're complicit with the unknown killer. Think more the vibe you get from seeing the act over the killer's shoulder like you often see in a Dario Argento movie, and it makes this movie a little uncomfortable funny enough. When it comes to the writing, Edge has a few problems. While most of the movie breezes along at a reasonable pace, at least by 80s standards, there certainly is a bit of padding in there. While it doesn't get in the way too much, things like the police investigation feels like it, well, really doesn't go anywhere, for instance. They play about as much a role in the focus of the film as the comedy cops in Last House on the left. It seems like they're almost there for exposition more than anything. There's also a focus on computers, which is given enough attention that the opening credits are done in an 80s digital format, complete with a cursor as it types out over the opening theme. Sure, it's an aspect of our lead couple, but if the film didn't feature a single computer, it would hardly make any difference. A bit of research is done on it, and a chat over them, other than that, yeah. It's a couple of minor things like this that feel like they should have streamlined the film in some way, but the problem is it's only 90 minutes long as it is. 
where they do add a little exposition, one can't help but feel it could have been delivered in a way that is more integrated with the rest of the story. And this is the bit where I contradict myself, I guess. With so many strands of the film that come and go, like the police and the computer aspects, like I say, I do wonder if the film needed or was intended to be a bit longer. I say this with a bit of reservation. It already feels quite slow, not in a bad way for me, but that's me. It just feels like some aspects of the story are missing. Running at 91 minutes, which is more or less normal for a slasher, but rather short for a giallo, and given Edge's nature as a hybrid of slasher and giallo, it seems like so many of the film's shortcomings could have been addressed with an extra 10 or 15 minutes, maybe more, and it wouldn't have felt out of place. It all leaves me wondering if a significant amount of the original screenplay was left out, for whatever reason. One thing the film does manage fairly well is keeping you guessing though. Suspects come and go, sometimes it's a little clunky in how it does it, sometimes it's very effective at presenting various characters as legitimate subjects. An example of the former would be the sheriff questioning the handyman in the church. And the latter, well that comes through the dialogue of the likes of Gerald and Richard. It's only once you've seen the film once through that the clues become a lot more obvious. And that's just the benefit of hindsight of course. I have to say I didn't expect the killer to be who it turns out to be. But it makes sense. This is the saving grace of the movie. It makes enough sense to work and it has just about enough blood hitting the screen to fulfil the less explicit gore-centric horror crowd's needs. One of the remarkable things about the film though is that aside from the giallo sensibilities, it feels very much like an American film. The locations that stand in for the forested areas in North California are very convincing, as are the production aspects that support them. I sent through many films that say they're set in this country or that country and were filmed in very unconvincing places. Yeah, and I'm thinking of our Jess Franco. But from the casting to the places the characters inhabit, it's all very convincing here. Of course, I'm not a California resident. I've never been there, but it's quite a surprise when you realise that this was shot in Spain. When I think of the film's shortcomings, I feel a little guilty on focusing on them at all. When I think about how much care was taken in this and other areas like this, and frankly the casting. Now when it comes to the casting, it's actually pretty good. The acting does shake a little at points, but for the most part, it stands up really well. The central characters of Gerald, Richard and Lillian seem to get better as the story goes along as well. This is to the point that I wonder if the film was largely shot sequentially. By the end of the movie, the actors that play Gerald and Lillian, Barton Forks and Christina Marie Lane respectively, improve quite significantly and give some fairly intense performances. But all over the cast, they do a pretty decent job. Page mostly recounted in an interview that director Jose Ramon Larraz allowed them to play with the dialogue. This is something that doesn't always happen with Euro exploitation. It's well known that the likes of Claudio Vergrasso that when he had a script you stuck to it to a fault, which can be a problem if you're dealing with English speaking actors who know better how to say the things that their characters would say than someone with a weaker grasp on the regional language. Larraz's directorial approach of trusting the actors with the character's dialogue does shine through though. While the actors are clearly a little inexperienced by big budget film standards, they actually hold up fairly well, and I can't think of a single performance that stands out as bad in any significant sense. Further to this, the characters are generally quite natural and stay away from being drawn from stock characters that make up the majority of other slasher films. When there is jockish behaviour, it's not a defining trait of the character. For instance, a lovely moment happens when Richard and Gerald have had a bit of a spat, and before Richard drives off, he makes peace with his friend. You know you're spending too much time with this girl on those stupid games that you play? You know, you're going to get in trouble and you're going to have microchips for brains. Have fun tonight. Stay safe. It's a moment I could just slip by, but it's very normal, it's very warm, very human moments that allow us to like these characters. Gerald's verbal sparring with his curmudgeon landlord is also quite fun. 
The characters obviously quite like each other, despite their mildly confrontational dialogue, and that really adds to the investment that you can give to the story. Like I said so many times, characterization is a very powerful part of how a story is told, and between the writing, the direction and the performances, the characters are pretty well handled. They're often likeable, mostly believable, at least within the movie's world, and are more textured with human traits than this kind of movie normally allows their peers to be. I can't say that Edge of the Axe is going to be everyone's cup of tea, though. It is quite a slow film, and it lacks the explicit kills that some would demand from the genre. But it does make up for that in so many ways. For every shortcoming, it piles in a couple of good things that it does really well. And as relatively low gore as the kills are, they're certainly all the more disturbing for how they're staged. All this with the added European slant to the genre makes Edge of the Axe more appear to the likes of the original Halloween on the US side of its influences. And with that healthy dose of giallo sensibilities, it, for me, stands out in the slasher genre as one that bucks the downward trend that so many of the increasingly lazy franchises drove into. Ultimately, Edge of the Axe sits quite comfortably right between the two genres though. Director Laraz found a sweet spot with a remarkably well-balanced combination of them. But I do wonder how it would play to a new audience. It's been a long time since horror was paced in the way that this film is. Not to say that there aren't any these days that take their time. And to be fair, Edge was probably about 10 years after its time. But looking at what the likes of Friday the 13th and Halloween have become, it's certainly a world where these films are expected to be fast and hard-hitting in the gore department. I do hold some regard and cheer in the fact that notable examples of slow-paced character-based horror are still being made and gaining respect. The works of Ari Aster or Robert Eggers are good examples of this, so I like to think that this rather unassuming and slightly remarkable title has its place in the world, and maybe your collections.